Welcome to my video series about the life of Haydn. In the first video, we will talk about Haydn's beginnings as a peasant until halfway through his residency as Kapellmeister at the court of Esterhazy. The life of Joseph Haydn is emblematic of the Enlightenment idea of the honne homme, or honest man. In the words of musicologist James Webster, an honest man is the man whose good character and worldly success enable and justify each other. His modesty and and probity were everywhere acknowledged. These traits were not only prerequisites to his success as Kapellmeister, entrepreneur, and public figure, but also aided in the favorable reception of his music. Haydn began life as a peasant and ended his life as the most celebrated musician across Europe. Joseph Haydn was born in Rohrau, Austria, a village that at the time stood on the border with Hungary. His father was Matthias Haydn, a wheelwright who also served as Marktrechter, an office akin to village mayor. Haydn's mother, Marie Neet Kohler, had previously worked as a cook in the palace of Count Harak, presiding aristocrat of Rauru. His family was very musically inclined. The family would engage in singing in the evenings with friends, even though they could not read or write music. Haydn's chance for a musical education in Rauru was limited, so when he showed promise at six years old, his family sent him to live with their relative, Johann Matthias Frankel, in Heinberg to further his musical education. The life in the Frankel household was not easy for Haydn, who later remembered being frequently hungry and humiliated by his filthy state of his clothing. He began his musical training there and could soon play both the harpsichord and the violin. People of Heinberg heard him singing treble parts in the church choir. Choir. There's a reason to think that Haydn's singing impressed those who heard him because in 1739 he was brought to the attention of George von Ruder, director of the music in St. Stephen's Cathedral in Vienna, who happened to be visiting Hainburg and was looking for new choir boys. Haydn passed his audition with Ruder and after several months of further training moved to Vienna where he worked for the next nine years as a chorister. Haydn was known his whole life as a trickster, playing practical jokes on his companions in his youth and musical jokes in his compositions later in life. It was a practical joke that got him thrown out of St. Stephen's Cathedral Choir. Haydn cut off a young lad's ponytail. The director was already looking to remove Haydn as his voice was changing, and even Empress Maria Theresa herself complained about his singing, calling it crowing. After snipping off the pigtail of the other chorister, Haydn was sent out into the streets with nothing but his clothes on his back. This started a hard period in Haydn's life as he tried to make it in Vienna as a freelance musician. This path, taken by both Mozart and Beethoven after him, was not as feasible in Haydn's time due to the nature of the Viennese musical society. Haydn survived on taking pupils, which he hated, and singing and playing at balls around Vienna. Eventually, in 1752, Haydn was employed as a accompanist for the Italian composer Nicola Porpora, from whom he later said he learned the true fundamentals of composition. Haydn's compositional education was completely ignored during his time as a chorister, so along with the daily contact with Porpora, Haydn worked through counterpoint exercises by himself, including the Gratis and Parnassium by Johann Josef Fuchs, still used for this purpose in music schools today. He also studied the works of Carl Emanuel Bach with fervor, whom he later acknowledged as an important influence. Haydn started gaining reputation as a composer, first through opera. With the increase in his reputation, Haydn eventually obtained aristocratic patronage, crucial for his career as a composer of the day. Countess Thun, having seen one of Haydn's compositions, summoned him and engaged him as a singing and keyboard teacher. In 1756, Baron Karl Josef Fernberg employed Haydn at his country estate where the composer wrote his first string quartets. Fernberg later recommended Haydn to Count Morzen, who in 1757 became his first full-time employer. 
Haydn's job title under Count Morzin was Kapellmeister, that is, music director. He led the Count's small orchestra and wrote his first symphonies for the ensemble. In 1760, with the security of a Kapellmeister position, Haydn married. His wife was the former Anna Maria Theresa Keller, the sister of Therese, with whom Haydn had previously been in love. Haydn and his wife had a completely unhappy marriage from which, at that time, there was no escape. They produced no children and both took lovers. Count Morzin soon suffered financial reverses that forced him to dismiss his musical establishment, but Haydn was quickly offered a similar job in 1761 by Prince Paul Anton, head of the immensely wealthy Esterhazy family. Haydn's job title was only Vice Kapellmeister, but he was immediately placed in charge of most of the Esterhazy musical establishment, with the old Kapellmeister Gregor Werner retaining authority for only church music. When Werner died in 1766, Haydn was elevated to full Kapellmeister. As a house officer in the Esterhazy establishment, Haydn wore livery and followed the family as they moved amongst their various palaces, most importantly the family's ancestral seat, Schloss Esterhazy, in Kismarten, today Eisenstadt, Austria. And later on Esterhaza, the grand new palace built in rural Hungary in the 1760s. Haydn had a huge range of responsibilities, including composition, running the orchestra, playing chamber music, music for and with his patrons, and eventually mounting of operatic productions. Despite this back-breaking workload, the job was, in artistic terms, a superb opportunity for Haydn. The Esterhazy princes were musical connoisseurs who appreciated his work and gave him daily access to his own small orchestra. During the nearly 30 years that Haydn worked at the Esterhazy court, he produced a flood of compositions, and his musical style continued to develop. Haydn's compositions followed the taste of his patron, first with an infatuation of an ancient, out-of-style instrument called the baryton, for which Haydn wrote 200 works for this instrument in various ensembles, the most notable of which are 126 baryton trios for the prince to play. After that, the prince became infatuated with opera, and the rural seat at Esterhazy began to produce a full operatic season with Haydn as music director. On top of his other composing duties, Haydn was the musical administrative head of the theater, responsible for developing the opera season, hiring singers, running rehearsals, and conducting the opera performances. He also began to write operas, first in the comic opera buffa style, then the more serious opera style as Prince Esterhazy's taste changed. Most of Haydn's operas are not produced today. Even Haydn admitted that each opera was written for a specific set of circumstances in Esterhazy and did not translate well to other houses, even in Haydn's lifetime. His most successful opera in modern times is Il Mondo della Luna, The World of the Moon, written in 1777 for the wedding festivities of the prince's second son, Count Nicholas, and the Countess von Weissenwolf. It was Haydn's last opera in which the buffo elements predominate. The story concerns a bogus astronomer, Elictico, who hoodwinks a gullible old man, Bona Fede, into thinking he has been transported to the moon. The finest number is the love duet between Elictico and Bona Fede's daughter, Clarice, Un Certo Rustichello. Let's hear a bit of that duet now, from a 1959 recording with singers Luigi Alva and Mariella Aiden. Listen for the classically balanced phrases and the way the strings support both voices.
1779 was a watershed year for Haydn as his contract was renegotiated. Whereas previously all of his compositions were the property of the Esterhazy family, he now was permitted to write for others and sell his work to publishers. Haydn soon shifted his emphasis in compositions to reflect this, with fewer operas, more quartets and symphonies, and he negotiated with multiple publishers, both Austrian and foreign. His new employment contract had acted as a catalyst in the next stage in Haydn's career, the achievement of international popularity. By 1790, Haydn was in the paradoxical position of being Europe's leading composer, but someone who spent his time as a duty-bound Kapellmeister in a remote palace in the Hungarian countryside. The new publication campaign resulted in the composition of a great number of new string quartets. Haydn also composed in response to commissions from abroad. The Paris symphonies in 1785 to 1786, and the original orchestral version of the Seven Last Words of Christ, a commission from Cadiz, Spain. Haydn is considered the father of the string quartet. He began to write for string ensembles early in his career, usually for trios of a violin, viola, and cello. Haydn began writing for the string grouping of two violins, viola, and cello to fit the instruments he had on hand for one commission. The form then flowered because it was seen as a balance of string voices. Other composers wrote string quartets, but it was Haydn's publication of his first Opus One that made the genre popular. The string quartet quartet was where the style of the classical era was first found. The change made itself felt most dramatically in 1781 when Haydn published the six Opus 33 string quartets, announcing in a letter to potential purchasers that, that they were written in a new and completely special way. Charles Rosen has argued that this assertion on Haydn's part was not just sales talk, but meant quite seriously, and he points out a number of important advances in Haydn's composition technique that appear in these quartets, advances that mark the advent of the classical style in full flower. These include a fluid form of phrasing in which each motif emerges from the previous one without interruption, the practice of letting accompanying material evolve into melodic material, and the kind of classical counterpoint in which each instrument part maintains its own integrity. These traits continue in many quartets that Haydn wrote after Opus 33. The Opus 33 quartets are called the Russian Quartets because they were dedicated to the Grand Duke Paul of Russia. The Russian Quartets were some of Mozart's favorite works by Haydn, and in 1785, Mozart dedicated six string quartets to Haydn in admiration of his quartets, Opus 33. Opus 33, number two, is called The Joke because of the wit Haydn used in writing it. The last move in the string quartet is a rondo, where the theme comes back a number of times. At the end of the rondo, starting in measure 148, Haydn implements a joke in this piece. It begins with a grand pause that makes the audience wonder if the piece is over. This is then followed by a sudden forte 16th note in the beginning of the adagio that shocks the audience. After this, the first violin plays the A theme of the opening phrase, with rests interrupting the music every two bars. The rests get progressively longer, giving the impression that the piece is over many times in a row, making for an amusing ending. During this time period, it has been said that audiences would erupt in laughter at this humorous coda. Haydn used this coda not only to make fun of audiences confused as to where to applaud, but also amateur musicians who were too beat-driven and what he deemed in a redundant rondo form. Let's hear the end of the quartet, The Joke.
At this point, Haydn is on the precipice of international fame, but is still required to stay at the remote Esterhaza castle, attending to the whims of Prince Nicholas. His new employment contract finally releases him to start selling his works to publishers in Vienna and abroad. In the next video, we will take up the life of Haydn right after he begins to write for an international audience. Thank you for joining me in this video about the life of Haydn. Don't forget to look out for the next video in this series about Haydn out soon. I'll put a link to the video in the description box once it goes live. I've left a link to my website in the description box below where you can find the bibliography for this video. Also in the description box is a link to my Patreon where you can support the making of these videos. Thanks again and see you next time.